Hi everyone, welcome to our lecture on money, the favorite topic of many students, money. We will divide this uh, lecture into two parts, uh, just easier for you to digest. The first part more about history of money and the second part more about what modern money is about. Okay, so let's start with the first question. Uh, what is money? Well, there is a number of definitions here, quite complicated usually. My idea is money is what money does. So let's think for a while, what is that money does in our life? And if you give a bit of thought to that, you will probably come up with four ideas. The first idea is money serves us as means of exchange. So uh, allows us to get uh, goods, to exchange one good for another, uh, using uh, money as a kind of transmission. So you sell something, you get money, you use this money to buy something else. Means of exchange. Unit of account. Money allows us to put some value on uh, goods, on services, Money allows us to create the whole uh, system of prices, and all prices are expressed in money. Store of wealth. Uh, some people may be rich because they have a good, successful business. Some people can be rich because they have several apartments they rent. Some people may be rich because they have a bag full of money. Money allows us to save. Money allows us to store our wealth. Money is a certain element of being rich. You can be rich because you have money. You can be rich because you have other assets as well. And the last function means for deferred payment, which simply means that money allows you to put uh, your payments off until later. So this is um, what you see with credit cards. You spend money now, but actually you pay later. This is what you see when you pay your electricity bill. So you pay for your electricity consumption from the previous month. So this is similar to the means of exchange, but different. The means of exchange is about exchanging things at the same time. I give you money, you give me something I want. Means for deferred payment means I get something first and after some time I pay you money. So, if we say money is what money does, then we simply call for a kind of functional definition of money. And since out of those, those four functions, the most important, the most useful, uh, the primary function is the function of the means of exchange, we will say that money for us would be a commonly accepted means of exchange. What makes good money? What are the features of money that money should have? There are some economic ones and there are also some physical features. Among those economic uh, features we've got scarcity. Money should be scarce. Money should be desired. A good money is the money that we have never enough of. 
So if you are tempted to say, yes, I want to have more money, that means money that you use is good money. Liquidity. Money should be liquid, which means that you should be able to exchange your money for any commodity, any good, and it shouldn't be expensive in the sense that you should not uh, lose value of your money and it should not be time consuming. And in most cases, uh, money that we have is liquid. If you want to buy something uh, that costs, let's say, five zloty, then, well, you simply use five zloty coin and you get the commodity. So that's not expensive. You don't lose anything. You simply uh, give five zloty coin for something that costs five. So you don't lose anything here. And it's not time consuming, right? Because most people who sell would sell for this five zloty coin, right? So money is kind of accepted. Which leads us to the next uh, feature, economic feature, acceptability. Uh, money should be readily and generally accepted, right? So if you go to the shop with your money, you should not be worrying whether they would um, accept the money from you or not. Would you be able to perform the transaction of, or, or not? Money should be readily and generally accepted and it should have a stable value. This is the last economic feature. So we would like money to retain its value over time. That is uh, difficult. Um, money, generally speaking, loses some value over time. But the idea here is we would like this loss, even if inevitable, to be as small as possible. Then there are some physical features like durability of money, that money should not wear out quickly or, or easily. Uh, portability, money should be uh, easy to handle, to transport in your pocket, in a bag. Uh, divisibility, which is not about dividing a banknote into two halves. It's more about uh, being able to serve for big and small transactions. So good money is money that allows you to buy a house if there is such a need and also something small like a newspaper. Uniformity, money of the same value should be of the same quality. It's like uh, we don't have many types of uh, 50 zloty banknotes. There is one, generally speaking, pattern and all 50s what the banknotes look more or less the same or quite the same. Uh, last but not least, money should be difficult to counterfeit, uh, which means money should be difficult to, to forge. Money should be difficult to be produced on somebody's own. Uh, if individuals would be able to produce money, then money wouldn't be scarce and that would be against this first, the most probably uh, important economic feature. I promised you a brief um, history of, of money. So let's start from the very beginning. Uh, what was the world without money? Uh, at first, people didn't have any money and they were using barter. Barter is about trading goods directly for some other goods. Barter is pretty pro problematic as it uh, requires so-called double coincidence of wants. That means that uh, for the transaction to happen, I must find someone who has the product I'm interested in. And this person at the same time must be interested in the product that I possess so that we could make the exchange. Double coincidence of wants. I want a certain product, let's say A. Someone who's got this product A wants product B that I have, right? So this is double coincidence of wants. 
With a uh, normal money, it's much easier. Single coincidence of wants is enough. It's enough if I find someone who wants my product, I sell it, I take money, then I simply look for someone who wants to sell what I want to buy. These are uh, single coincidence of wants. Uh, barter makes it very difficult to storing up value and dividing it. So this is divisibility uh, and the store of wealth functions and features of money respectively, right? Uh, so for instance, uh, if you grow strawberries, you can't store them for a long period of time, right? Uh, so if you are a farmer or you, and you specialize in growing uh, strawberries, then you have like one month when you have your strawberries to make bartering for the rest of the year. So you need to uh, be able somehow to trade your strawberries in June for your Christmas tree, for instance. Because in December, when you need your Christmas tree, you don't have any strawberries to make a trade. Uh, dividing uh, value is also a problematic thing here. So if you, for instance, have a horse, then you are unable to perform a small transaction, right? You want to trade a horse for a newspaper. Exchange rate is problematic. There are thousands of possible exchange rates with differences in quality come to that. Actually, barter is really very problematic. So, uh, as it proved to be inefficient, it is nowadays uh, replaced practically completely uh, by trade that is based on money. Sometimes we see some bartering, you know, between neighbors. So, I teach my neighbor's son mathematics and he, well, he's a car mechanic, so he fixes my car. Okay, such situations are are possible, right? Or you help uh, your older neighbor uh, with some shopping and she bakes a cake for you. Uh, these are examples of, of bartering, but they are of, of minor importance for the economic situation of the country. What is important, what we uh, should remember here is that invention of money made it possible to introduce specialization and labor division in societies, which immensely increased efficiency uh, of the economy. So this is what money should be praised about. Uh, money allows us to specialize and to divide labor. So we specialize at some particular things. We earn our money in this way and we buy everything mm -hmm else that we that we need then uh, we proceed to the first type of money which was commodity uh, money uh, so in many societies some kind of money emerged as a commonly accepted means of exchange uh, depending on the society depending on the culture depending on the continent uh, different types of commodity money served as accepted means of exchange. So that was cattle, that was salt, corn, oil, olive, uh, olive oil, wine, beaver force, uh, amber in some regions, many other things. Uh, and what, what is funny actually is, is the fact, for instance, that uh, some traces of this commodity money uh, uh, are still with us. Like, for instance, it is believed that if you spill salt, then there will be a kind of argument in the family. That comes from the times where salt was very expensive. Uh, it was uh, widely used as money. And if you could uh, spill salt, then obviously that was a kind of reason for, for fighting and arguing between you and your husband or your wife, for instance. This commodity money had uh, some value. The value of commodity money uh, had 
its origin in the current value of the commodity itself. So each of those, like cattle, salt, corn, olive oil, wine, and, and others, they were all representing some value in the local market. So that was the source of the value for the money, for this, for this commodity as money. Uh, commodity money is sometimes created quite spontaneously. So if you look, for instance, uh, in the prisoners of war camps, you will find out that cigarettes were quite popular as money there. So uh, cigarettes uh, were commonly accepted means of exchange. They were scarce, uh, they were desired, not only by smokers for obvious reasons, but also by non-smoking people who knew that they could buy something, they could get something in return for cigarettes. In the concentration camps, for instance, this form of commodity money was performed by slices of bread, right? A lot of hunger in those, in those concentration uh, camps uh, and bread was very attractive, very desired, and it was commonly accepted means of exchange. If you wanted to get something when you were in Auschwitz, for instance, you would try to buy it with, with bread quite often. Let's move on. Metallic money. Metallic money like um, money made of silver, gold, copper, other types of, of, of metal. Uh, remember, this is just another example of commodity money, in fact. So if some people say, yeah, we should go back to the time when money was kind of supported by gold, gold money would be, would be something. Well, gold money is like cows or, or oil or salt just another commodity but obviously metallic money was good at some time i mean gold gold and and silver were of a high value their price was relatively stable over over centuries they were precious over centuries uh, they were pretty durable metal is quite divisible you can get a smaller amount of metal. So uh, it was uh, something that was uh, easily recognized by people. People readily accepted gold or silver. So in fact, that was a good type of, of, of money, better than other commodity money. Uh, so, uh, that's for sure. Uh, how about standardization of, of this kind of money? You know, a cow is a cow. Of, obviously, a cow can be a, of a different quality, right? Salt, well, you, you, you can try to weigh it and, and you know how much uh, salt you have. So if, if salt is money, then you can count your money in this way. Uh, with metallic money, uh, we have coins that were invented. Coins... Uh, made of gold or silver, a uh, standardized uh, amount of gold or silver was, was used uh, for producing coins. Uh, each coin was uh, stamped with a certain seal uh, and the seal usually showing you the king, the ruler or some very important symbol um, like national symbols. The seal was meant to guarantee that the amount of the precious metal in the coin is the correct one. It is, you know, according to the standards. Okay. Obviously, metallic money um, had its disadvantages. Uh, this standardized uh, contents of precious metal could be sometimes doubtful. Uh, if you look at the findings of archaeologists, for instance, it is uh, 
pretty well known that uh, different money from different periods of the Roman Empire show the smaller and smaller ever decreasing amount of uh, silver. Why was it so? Well, that was because uh, Roman emperors used to debase the coinage, like many other rulers as well. So you simply put some gold coins into a melting pot, you add some other metals, you melt them all together, and you produce coins again. So you increase the quantity of coins at the expense of their quality, at the expense of a smaller contents of, of gold. But it is quite difficult, you know, uh, to recognize. If you decrease the uh, contents of gold by 2%, 3%, 5%, normal, ordinary people would not see that. And you can have 2%, 3% or 5% more coins, which could help you for your budget deficit. You know, budget deficit is a pretty old problem. Metallic money wasn't very portable. That's why uh, we could see that paper money came into use and gradually replaced metallic money. That may be kind of uh, strange to you. How was it possible that people gave up gold or silver, precious metals, and they decided to use paper, paper money? Uh, the answer to how was it possible uh, will be given in the lecture dedicated to banking system and banks, generally speaking. You know, the first banknotes were just representatives of commodity money. So those papers represented a given amount of, of gold. And if the institution that issued this kind of paper was pretty reliable, such papers could be treated as good as gold. But you know, if the institution was reliable, that uh, raises some concerns about the reputation of the institution that issues this kind of bank. Well, uh, this kind of paper money that was backed by gold was very uh, popular till uh, the 20th century, till the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, and uh, the money that was used uh, up to this time was convertible into gold, meaning there was a certain uh, official amount of gold that was the representation of the paper money that was used. If you had a banknote, you could go with this banknote to the central bank, uh, produce this banknote and ask for the corresponding amount of gold and you would have it. So most countries were on the so-called gold standard and that was very useful, especially when it comes to the uh, exchange rate mechanism. I mean, Exchange rates were very easy uh, to be created uh, because whenever you wanted to exchange one type of money, one currency for another currency, uh, you just had to look at what amount of gold is represented by the first currency and the second currency and make it equal. So, for instance, if British pound uh, represent twice as much gold as American dollar, then it simply takes two dollars uh, for the exchange rate uh, into one British pound. So that would be this. And this nice uh, exchange rate mechanism was in operation till the First World War. The First World War slightly changed uh, the situation. Well, not slightly, actually. You know, uh, that was the first war that used so much of equipment. You know, the First World War is the war where tanks are used for the first time. 
uh, airplanes are used. This is the time of huge battleships uh, and obviously all this military equipment produced by one side of the uh, of the war is destroyed by the other side, right? Uh, so fighting means destroying all this uh, production. Producing this military equipment was very, very expensive. After the First World War, most countries that took part in this war realized that they produced actually much more money. They printed much more money than they had gold. So they could not uh, come back to convertibility to gold. And from that moment, uh, their currencies were not backed by gold anymore. That was for most of major economies in the world, except for the US dollars, because uh, the USA decided to keep their uh, convertibility to gold uh, after the First World War. Uh, after the Second World War, even the USA were um, kind of forced to give up gold convertibility uh, in the 1970s that happened uh, and modern money is not convertible in, into gold anymore. So the question now is if modern money is not convertible into gold why does it have its value? So what is the source of the value of modern money? Modern money is called token money or fiat money. Fiat money like based on trust. Token money, you know what a token is. It's a symbolic money. So you could say it's made of material uh, which value is absolutely very small comparing to the value of the money itself. The value of the material for a $100 bill is very small. But $100 bill represents a high value. So the question is, why do people accept token money? Uh, and the answer, as silly as it may sound, is token money is accepted because it is accepted. What does that mean? Uh, if you imagine that you are offered a job, you, you have to wash a car and you will be paid 100. Uh, if you want to take this kind of job, it comes from the fact that you are pretty sure that if you get your 100 bill, you will be able to spend it. So you accept the job and you accept the payment because you know that if you go to the shop, this money will be accepted in the shop. So it is accepted because it is accepted. Additionally, modern money is also accepted because it is declared by the government as legal tender. And a legal tender is the payment that cannot be refused and the settlement of debt. Um, or speaking more plainly, um, if you want to operate a business in a given country, let it be Poland, you need to pay taxes. Taxes can be paid by legal tender. Only money that is officially declared currency has the power of um, being used in the payment of taxes. For instance, you cannot pay taxes in Poland using American dollars or euros. You pay taxes using Polish złoty and that creates demand for Polish złoty. So whatever business you run, you need Polish currency to pay your taxes. So you are going to accept this kind of currency. If you accept it, if many business owners accept it, then everyone accepts it because token money is accepted because it is accepted. Okay, so that would be uh, all about the short story of, of money. In the second part of our lecture, we will reveal some more features of modern money. Thank you very much for your attention.